Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing builders first source stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Builders first source is a vertically integrated building material supplier. It provides materials to remodelers, multifamily and single family home construction. The company is headquartered in Dallas, Texas and was founded in 1998. It went public in 2005 and trades on the NASDAQ, Mexican Bolsa and Deutsche Börse. It is the largest supplier of building products, prefabricated components and value added services in the US. It provides manufacturing and installation of a full range of structural and related building products directly to home builders. It manufactures floors, roofs, wall panels, stairs, millwork, windows, and doors. Its products and services are distributed across 550 locations in 40 states. The company is continuously trying to expand its customer base and product offerings organically and through acquisition. In 2015, it acquired ProBuild, resulting in a company with $6.1 in combined revenue during the first year of the acquisition. In 2019, it acquired Rainy Components and Rainy Construction, located in Groveland, Florida, adding $140 million of revenue to the company. In 2020, it acquired Bianchi & Company, a millwork supplier and install company located in Charlotte, North Carolina, adding $30 million of revenue to the company. Also in 2020, it merged with BMC Stock Holdings. This merger helped the company become the largest building and construction company in the U.S beating out ABC Supply for the first time. Also, this merger is a big reason the company's stock has doubled in the past 12 months. Merging with BMC helped increase its customer base significantly and resulted in large economies of scale. When you become a larger company, you can buy more products and pay less per product. For example, before the merger, you may have bought 1 million items for $10 each, then after the merger, you buy 1.5 million items for $9 each. Also, companies usually save on payroll as they grow and become bigger. In 2021, the company is expecting to save 60 to $70 million in expenses. Next year, they're expected to save over $100 million in expenses. Then after that, $130 to $150 million. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, $9 billion market cap, they're trading at $44 a share, and they have 207 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They had positive free cash flow in 18, 19, and 20, but negative in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that grew a lot from 200 million to 477 million. Revenue is the sales for the company. And that also grew a lot from 7.8 billion to 10.9 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Their main cost of revenue is the cost of supplies and the cost of labor. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and they had their highest gross profit in the trailing 12 months at 2.8 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Examples are marketing and depreciation. Then below that is operating income. Their operating income doubled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, and they paid 115 million, which was lower than 2020 of 136 million. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which more than doubled from 2019 from 200 million to 477 million. This is a breakdown of their revenue in the first quarter of 2021. So you can see lumber more than tripled. In the first quarter of 2020, it was 550 million. Now it's 1.7 billion. They are selling more lumber, but a main reason for the increase was the price of lumber. But pretty much everything increased. A lot of things doubled. Manufacturing products more than doubled. Windows almost doubled. Roofing and insulation went up about 50%. Siding, metal, and concrete products almost doubled. Other building products and services more than doubled. So the company is doing an amazing job growing its revenue with the help of the acquisitions and mergers, also with the help of rising commodity prices. 
This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Their operating cash flow was pretty low in the trailing 12 months since they had such high net income. Let me show you why. The way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, then you add back the non-cash items on the income statement, then you adjust for changes in working capital. The reason their operating cash flow was so low was this negative $581 million of receivables. So that means they sold nearly $600 million of products or services and didn't receive the cash. So they booked the revenue onto the income statement so it makes their revenue look high and their net income look high, but they didn't receive any cash. So their operating cash flow is low. But that's for this quarter. Next quarter and the following quarters, when the cash comes in, it's gonna make their cash flow look high relative to their net income. If you look at the financials over a longer period of time, like three, four, five years, everything makes sense. But when you look at just one quarter or one year, it may not make so much sense. They purchased $480 million of inventory. That's a cash negative. Their cash goes down $480 million. But they bought most of this on credit, $450 million of payables. So that's kind of a wash. So I would ignore the inventory since payables went up a similar amount. The main reason they had low operating cash flow was the receivables. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And they did have negative free cash flow in the trailing 12 months because they sold so much on credit. But their free cash flow should be a lot higher in future quarters. They also had low free cash flow in 2020. Once again, they sold a lot on credit. In 2020, they added $300 million of debt that year, but in 2018 and 19, they paid down more debt than that. Also in the trailing 12 months, they paid down a lot of debt. So the company is reducing their debt load overall, which is good. They did repurchase some capital stock, but not too much, 5 million, 10 million, and 4 million. These blue lines in the top chart show how many shares the company has outstanding. And you can see they have over 200 million shares outstanding currently, but last quarter, they only had 100 million shares outstanding. When we just looked at the statement of cash flows, they didn't issue any capital stock and dilute their shareholders. The reason they have so many more shares outstanding was the merger with BMC. BMC had 68 million shares outstanding. They gave each shareholder 1.3 shares of builder stock. If you own builder stock, you don't want to see more shares outstanding because that means you have a smaller piece of the pie. But that's not true in this situation. It's not like they just added shares and diluted the shareholders. They added shares, but also added the assets of BMC. So it's kind of like a wash. When they merged with BMC, the number of shares they added grew proportionally to its asset base. But the idea is they'll be a stronger company and they'll be able to generate more free cash flow together than individually. At least that's the goal. Let's look at the capital structure, $5 billion of equity, $2 billion of debt. They're 70% equity, 30% debt. And their weighted average cost of capital, which is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt is 9%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 16 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $14 billion. We divide that by 207 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $67. They're trading at $44, so they're trading at a 34% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. The company originally projected their free cash flows to be $800 to $900 million in 2021. Then they revised that to $1.3 to $1.5 billion. I thought that $1.3 to $1.5 billion was pretty aggressive. And my future free cash flows for 2021 was a little lower than $800 million, $743 million. And I grew that 10% of the year. That's how I came up with my future free cash flows. Even though most of my videos used the prior free cash flows to estimate the future, their prior free cash flows were with a company that didn't merge with BMC. Now they're a lot bigger of a company, so I have to adjust their free cash flows accordingly. Simply Wall Street is a lot higher than me. They're at $82 a share, so they're saying the stock is 47% undervalued. 10 analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $65. The low was 60, the high was 70. So all in a pretty tight range. 
This is the stock price since it started trading. It looks like it IPO at around $20, but the first few years it really struggled. It came down a lot. And then it traded sideways for many years. Then the next few years it did grow little by little. Then it really shot up the past year. This is the stock price the last year. So you can see it pretty much doubled in price. A big reason was the increase in lumber prices and also all their acquisitions and mergers. But the stock price has regressed in the past few weeks. It looks like it's down about 10%. This is a pretty volatile stock. It has a beta of 2.42, so the stock moves two and a half times the market. The stock went up over 100% in the past 52 weeks, much better than the S&P 500 at 35%. The 52 week low was 19, the high was 54, and the stock is trading above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a pretty liquid stock, 2.5 million to 3 million shares are traded each day. Of the 207 million shares outstanding, 204 million are on float. All the shares are held by institutions, and almost 7% of the shares on float are shorted. And this stock has done really well in the past year, 3 years and 5 years, up a lot more than its industry and the market. Surprisingly, analysts are only expecting their earnings to grow 9%, whilst industry grows 14% and the market 16%. And they're expecting their revenue to pretty much be flat, only growing half a percent, whilst industry grows 6% and the market 9%. In the past five years, their annual earnings are up 34%. That's really good. It's industry 5% and the market 12%. In the last year, their earnings grew 145%. Very impressive. It's industry 23% and the market 21%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, that's pretty much at its low point. And you kept that money in, you would have over $200,000 today. That's a 20x return, an annual return of 35%. The biggest shareholder is BlackRock at 12.5%. They own 26 million shares valued at $1.1 billion. The next is Vanguard at 10%, then Fidelity, Wellington, and Coliseum Capital. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 32, the median is 22. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have a 19 P.E., so investors are paying $19 for $1 of earnings, which is better than the market median and average. Their price to sales is 0.8. When a company has a price to sales below 1, that means their revenue is higher than their market cap. That's not common. Their price to book is 1.8, and price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet, it's assets minus liabilities, and they have 5 billion of equity, but only 1 billion of tangible equity, since they have 4 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. The reason they have so much intangibles is because of all the mergers and acquisitions they've done. Their return on invested capital is only 8%, and their WAC is 9%. You generally want to see an ROIC greater than the WAC. They can cover their interest payments six times. They have a good ROE at 10%, better than the market median. And they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. Their current liabilities are 1.8 billion of receivables and 1.6 billion of inventory. So it is good they're making a lot of sales, but they seem to have pretty loose credit terms, so they're not getting the cash right away. It would be a lot better to have the cash to grow the business than waiting for your customer to give it to you. But they do have $1.1 billion of payables, but maybe that's just the nature of this industry to give really lenient credit terms. So they did have negative free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, but I think they could have really strong free cash flow in the following quarters. They do have $360 million of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So they have $350 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry I've done videos of five companies in the same industry as Builders, and if Builders has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're better than average in all the price multiples, which is great. They're worse than average in current ratio. They have a positive ROE, the average is negative. They're lower in debt than average. They've been doing a good job the past few years at paying down debt, and they're the second biggest company at 9.1 billion market cap, and they've never paid a dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 34% discount, and this company is doing a really good job at growing its business through acquisitions and mergers. But sometimes synergies between companies don't always work out. So far, it seems like they're doing a good job at that. So they're constantly growing their revenue. Their free cash flow hasn't been growing, but I expect it to grow a lot this year and next. 
I'm really excited to see how this company does in 2021. I rank their free cash flows 4 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.